<coughs> it's the 22nd of December. This has been a fast, exciting month. It has gone very well. The, uh, so this month we've been looking at a series, Follow the Star, and we've just been looking at the birth of Jesus in, in these different stories in Matthew and in Luke. And again, um, kind of the only story of the, these guys that actually did follow the star. Some of these other ones had angels show up and speak to them. But this morning we are in Matthew 2, um, verses 1 to 12. And I, I don't know about you, I've actually really enjoyed, again, looking at these very familiar stories, but going, okay, God, what do you have for me in this season, at this time? And so it is um, really exciting to look at Jesus coming, knowing that he has come, and just the, the journey that they went through and the invitation that it is for us to step into the journey again. Um, and it is quite an amazing story. I don't think you could actually write this outside of the Spirit. It is amazing, all the pieces and how this came together for the birth of Jesus. And I have said this before, and I'll say it again. It is not a story to read. It is a story that is meant to impact our life again and again and again and again. The birth of our Savior birth of our Savior. And I hope that um, you maybe have read it throughout this season, and maybe in the next couple days you'll read it again, but um, I found myself thinking of those words in Isaiah 55, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, and my ways are nothing like your ways. And that is this story, where most of us would not have written it this way. And we go, God, you are amazing. You are amazing, you are amazing, you are amazing. How profound it is that he scripted a story and said, come, I want you to be part of it. And I love it. And his ways um, are really beneficial when we apply them to our lives. Really beneficial. Sometimes we stumble into the ways of God. We go, whoa, that's Jesus. <laughs> Other times we read scripture and we go, that's Jesus. And we hear him, that's Jesus. However it happens, we need to apply ourselves to the ways of Jesus to truth, John 8, to truth. And this story is um, an interesting story of, of some people who don't know truth or they, they see a star, but they're, they're going on this journey and they are confronted with truth. And, and the whole story is the truth of the Savior coming and how people respond to it. And so this morning, um, why don't we read these? So where's Chuck? Chuck's gonna come up and read um, Matthew 2, verses 1 to 12 for us. Oh. Gone? Yeah. Oh. I'm here? Good. Yep. <laughs> After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem uh, with him. When he <laughs> called together all the people's chief, chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophecies had written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report him to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming into the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. 
Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Thanks, Chuck. Thank you. Why don't we pray, just as we begin. So God, we, uh, we value your life, the life of Jesus, the Savior. Lord, and we, uh, we are so thankful for what you have done for us, God, the plan you put in place to make a way for us to know life, and we want to embrace it in fullness. We want to embrace the fullness of Jesus, the Savior of the world. And so thank you that throughout history, people have searched for you. And we commit to being in that line of people who search carefully for Jesus, who pursue you. And so this morning, we ask that you would open the scriptures to us. You would show yourself to us, God. We want you. In your name, amen. And so it's, it's great to read 12 verses and go, there's the story, but those 12 verses did not happen in the two minutes he read them in. They happened over the courses of years, and so it would have been quite the story to actually live out. And so we want to have a, a look at this. And so in verse 1, as was read, um, it says Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod, and there were some wise men who came from the eastern land to Jerusalem, and they were looking. And so who were these wise men? They were also known as magi, um, astrologers. They studied the stars. Um, and they were on a journey because they saw something, and they said, this means there's a king, which is really quite profound because we see stars all the time except when it's all socked in. Um, but we do see stars quite often, and what do they mean to us? And these guys, and they were most likely Iran, from Iran, Iraq, Yemen, Saudi Arabia. Um, they traveled between 1,000 miles, 1,200 miles, because they saw a star, and it meant there's a king. And we actually need to go and find this king. And so we're not going to go and just go do a Sunday thing. We're actually going to go on this journey. And we're not quite sure how long it's going to take. But pack up the camels and we're going for a walk. And so these guys committed to something that they didn't know the end result. Other than it, we are going to get to the king. And it's really wild when you start thinking about how these guys followed or they were going towards Jesus, a Jesus they didn't know versus the Jesus we do know and how do we pursue him. And so when I think about this journey, um, it would have been quite dangerous. Let's be honest. They had frankincense, myrrh, and gold. People want that stuff. So it would have been a dangerous journey they're going on. They're following a star, which means they're often traveling at night because that's when stars are out. Like, it, like when you start unpacking and looking at this, go, this would have been quite the adventure for these guys to go on because they saw a star and it meant there's a king. There's a king and we have to go and find the king. And so they went on this journey. And we know it's about two years because um, following our 12 verses in the next, um, in the next set of verses, um, we know that King Herod is quite enraged because of how the Magi did not um, come back and speak to him. And so King Herod has all the babies two years old and under in accordance with the Magi's and the star appearing killed. And so we know this is a long journey these guys have gone on in search of the king. They're looking for Jesus, the God they don't even know. But something has stirred their hearts to go, and so they've gone on this question, this journey. And so they show up, they show up in Bethlehem in Judea, and uh, or they show up with Herod, and they have um, they have one question to ask, and they have one observation to share, and they have one declaration that they are going to live out. And I think it's a good thing for us to actually look at. And so it's found in verse 2. So they say, where, where is the newborn king of the Jews? Where is he? Here's, here's their observation. We saw his star as it rose. 
and then the declaration, and we've come to worship him. That's what they're doing. It's verse two. They go, where is the king? Where is he? We know he's here, so tell us where he is. And the second thing is we saw a star in amongst all the other stars. It goes, we saw his star and we followed it, and now we're here to worship, so where is he? And the announcement of Jesus, as, as I shared last week, was different than any other announcement of any other king that's ever come to earth. Every other king comes with fa- fame and flair, and they proclaim it. They make all these headlines, and Jesus showed up at night in the dark, in a manger, in a stable, in the back country with a bunch of smelly shepherds that show up, and that's the savior of the world. It's a different arrival of a king. All I know is um, the stars were speaking of our Savior long before he showed up. You know, and I love the boldness that these guys come with. So these strangers to the land walk in, and they meet with King Herod, who is the king, and they say, hey, we're here. Where's the new king? Where is he? And I just love the boldness. It's not like, hey, let's feel this out. Let's just see how it's going. Hey, um, just wondering what you think about the new king. Just wonder if it's like they're not feeling it out here. They step out with such conviction. Just imagine they've gone on a two-year journey, and how else could you not but step out in such boldness, conviction? Oh, where's the king? We've come to worship him. The problem is there was a king, and his name is Herod. And kings in those days, they demanded worship. And they expected worship, and they would kill those who didn't worship them. But yet these men showed up in such conviction and such boldness and said, where is the king? We've come to worship him. Where is he? Tell me, where is he? You know, and it doesn't say that maybe they would just come in and bow down to Herod, but it doesn't, like that, that's not included in here, but it is included that they bow down to Jesus later on, which is profound. They understand who the king is. And just a a few points, and Herod actually wasn't a true Jewish king. He was an Edomite who was put in place by the Roman Empire. So this would have been even more threatening to him. That somebody is showing up to find, to go, I'm searching for the real king. Where is he? And I think I was, I was this morning, I was upstairs reading and, and praying. I was just reminded of Hebrews 4.16. And it says, because of Jesus, because of what Jesus has done, let us approach God with confidence, with, it, it, like boldness. And so I was just going, man, these guys had such confidence and boldness in a God they didn't know because they saw a star that they had followed for two years. We know Jesus, and so often I'm scared, and I don't approach with boldness. Go, let, me lo- let me learn from the wise men that I'd walk in boldness. And so these wise men are having a conversation with Herod, and it, it probably would have been pretty deflating for Herod. Because all of a sudden these wise men from the east show up and they have gifts and they have treasures and they're not for Herod. And instead of not even being for Herod, they go, hey, we've heard of a king. Where is he? And so it would have been so deflating. And Herod, um, you know, Herod has wise men and people around him and they never told him. Or maybe they did tell him and Herod didn't believe it. But either way, Herod would have been deflated going, what do you mean there's another king? I met. Ultimately, these guys walked for two years to say, hey, your kingdom's coming to an end because there's a savior of the world. And he's a different king than you are. He's a different king than any king on earth in history. And he's going to save humanity. And we know, um, looking through the Old Testament, there was like hundreds of prophecies telling this was going to happen. And so whether it's Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, Isaiah 11, Jeremiah, Numbers, Micah 5, 2, um, there's so many Old Testament prophecies which um, Herod probably was upset with his, his crew, his informers, because they never told him, hey, there's going to be a king coming. And the wise men showed up. In verse 3, it said, Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in 
in Jerusalem. And the question is, why was he disturbed? Why was he disturbed? Truth showed up. Why was he disturbed? Well, his kingdom was coming to an end as he knew it. Truth has this way of disturbing us like nothing else does. Who's been disturbed by the Bible before? Lots of us. Why? Because there's things inside our lives that are not lining up with it. And when the truth shows up, we go, oh, this is hard. And we are faced with an opportunity to go, I, I'm going to choose the way of truth or I'm going to choose my own way. You know, and it's interesting because all the Jewish people would have known the Messiah was coming. They've known the prophecies. They would have memorized them. They would have had to read them. And it was happening right there. Christ coming to earth means change. Christ coming to us means we need to change or we get to change. It's a good thing. We're shown a new way to live. Who's being changed because of Christ? Who needs to change more because of Christ? Perfect, we're all in the same boat. Christ coming to us means we get to change and it's not something we should be disturbed about. It is something we should celebrate and go the grace of God has come to my life that I get to change to be more like him. That's the goal. But he was disturbed by truth. He didn't have a grid for it. He didn't like it. So he... um, He did what so many of us do. He got offended, and then he tried to kill what he didn't know. And I was thinking about this over the last couple days, and yesterday riding a chairlift with Hart, we were discussing this. Um, And I was like, never in history has this idea of my truth held such authority in people's lives. We know for years people have decided their own truth and they've walked it out, but never has culture ever put such language and such authority around, oh, that's the way you feel? Then it must be your truth. Never has deception been at such an all-time high where people have bought into it and actually changed their lives to walk it out. And Jesus is here going, no, 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 I am the truth. Here's the truth, but too often we get offended by it, and we get disturbed. <laughs> and it is a lie, and I've, I've watched it over the last few years where it has had language, where I've been in meetings and people go, oh, this is, this is our truth, this is my truth, and they're trying to justify what they're doing because this is their truth, and I go, there is no truth out of the truth. Without the truth, you got nothing. And so Herod is in this situation going, I don't know if I wanted to believe the truth. And he was disturbed. And so what did he do? Well, he had a meeting. Because that's what you should do, I guess, when you're disturbed. Have a meeting, call people, and try to get people to agree with you to support your disturbance. Who's done that? So often we're upset at something. We're like, instead of going to God, let's get people and disturb each other and try to get them all on my team together. That's what Herod did, and trying to understand what's going on. So in verse 4, he called a meeting of all the leading priest teachers of the religious law, and he said, where's the Messiah to be born? Herod asked the question everyone knows, and the answer is in verse 5, in Bethlehem, in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And in verse 6, it says, oh, in Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, you are not least among the ruler cities. For a ruler will come for you who will be the shepherd of my people. Well, where did that come from? That came from Micah verse 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be a ruler over Israel, whose, whose origins are from old and from ancient times. They knew this. They knew it was coming. But... When you are living with a king who likes to kill people, you probably don't want to tell them the truth because you might lose your head. But the wise men didn't know. They figured, hey, let's go tell the truth. (laughs) They weren't so caught up in, in the spirit of the age. They just thought we're following a star and we're going for Jesus. We're going for a savior. You know, when Herod's teachers... And leading priests, they didn't say it because they were scared of him. I mean, I would be, you know, a guy who likes to kill people, I'd be scared of him too. But the problem is fear does some real horrible things to us as we've 
talked about over the last few weeks. It dictates how we live life, and we're not called to live under fear at all. Greater love casts out fear. Jesus was coming to cast out fear, to set the captives free. And I love that even at the birth of Jesus, he was calling people unto himself. Everyone thinks, or a lot of people would say at the cross, he was drawing people to himself. It started at the birth. It started before the prophecies. At his birth, he was calling people from all over the land to himself. They didn't even know who he was. They were following a star. It's so amazing to come and wonder at his birth. And this, um, this is a defining moment for Herod. And I, I was looking at my own life. It's a defining moment for me. He said, says, and he was struck with truth. Herod was struck with truth, and he had a choice to make. The truth walked through his palace door. It was called the Magi, and they didn't even know it. The truth rolled out of his religious leaders and teachers' mouths. They said, this is where the king is to be born. And the question is, will you walk in the truth? Will you bow your knee to the truth? Why? So I can be free. And regularly, am I going, do I, am I willing to bow my knee to the truth of Jesus so I can be free? Again and again and again. And I'm so thankful one day I get to go to heaven, but I long for heaven to invade earth here. I want to be free. And I think that is Jesus. Bow your knee, come and be free. Will I be like the Magi? Will I be wise and search and discover and worship? Or will I try to keep my kingdom by whatever means I need to keep my kingdom? And that is society. They are going to keep what they got. And it doesn't matter what it takes. I'm going, I'm going to give in to Jesus again and again. The comfort of my truth versus real living in the truth. Following Jesus is not always real comfortable. It would be great to ask the wise men, how comfortable was the journey? <laughs> Probably wasn't that great. But what they found changed their lives forever. What we have has changed our lives forever. And I want to keep growing in the truth and walking in it. I don't want to keep my kingdom at any cost. It's too dangerous. And so how often do, uh, do I feel challenged and uncomfortable like Herod did? <laughs> how often do we? You know, I think of this last year that we've, we've got to go on. It was pretty uncomfortable at times. It was very uncomfortable, actually. It was uncomfortable from the get-off, making a phone call and going, hey, I think I need your job. It's terribly uncomfortable. It's really uncomfortable. It's not something I would have done. It's really uncomfortable talking to people that I love dearly and saying, hey, this is what God's saying. It's really uncomfortable talking to my kids and going, hey, this is what I think God's saying. But it was so right. And so I think then I start looking at other areas of my life and going, where have I fallen into just the comfort of this is how I want to do it versus this is what Jesus wants me to walk in. I'm saying, come and walk in the truth. Come and walk in in the truth. You know, and I was reminded again, because over the fall, just several times of just repentance and forgiveness, and it is such good news. Anyone who thinks repentance is this heavy, hard thing, repentance is like one of the best words out there. It is freedom. Come and repent and know truth. And like, it's so freeing. And so Herod was offered this moment to go, hey, come and bow your knee and know truth. And he fought against it. And so after they had that meeting, they had a conversation. And then in verse 7, it says, then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men and learned from the time when the first star appeared. Because the first meeting went so well, figured let's have another private meeting um, to figure this out. And I don't know how long this meeting went on for, but what Herod said to them was profound in verse 8. And it's the thing that has probably stuck out most to me in this. He said, then 
he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. When you find him, come back and tell me so I can go and worship him. And Herod gave them this profound advice. He said, search carefully for the child. I was like, search carefully for the child. How carefully do I search for Jesus? And I started um, thinking about that. How carefully do I search for Jesus? How car- carefully do we search for Jesus? And, and there's a lot of things that we're really careful for, with in life. What are some of the things we're really careful with? Money? Well, some people. <laughs> I agree with you. Who, babies, yeah. Who's ever held a baby? It's like a full two-handed adventure. Like new ones, they're super floppy, bobblehead. Just like you got, it's a full thing. You're super careful. You should be. And that's why we don't let, generally we don't let our three-year-olds hold them unless they're sitting down with pillows everywhere (laughs) because we want to be careful and we're thinking about it. There's a lot of things we're really careful with. We're trying to be careful with this and this and this and I was totally challenged. I go, do I put that type of care and concern into carefully looking for my Savior? Is that the type of care I put into searching? I was like, man, I, I don't know if I always do. I need to and I want to. How do I search carefully for him? Search carefully for Jesus. And it's, a, it's, an, interesting, it's an interesting phrase. You know, I don't know. You guys know what your life in light Jesus looks like. I want to search carefully for him because I don't want to miss him. I don't want to just have a piece of them. I want all of Jesus. We got to search carefully for things. Search carefully for him. And I think the, the words of evil King Herod are the words that can make you a wise man. Search carefully for the child and worship him. Makes you a real wise person. <laughs> Why? Because when we begin to worship Jesus we more likely will quit worshiping the other things. When we set our eyes on Jesus, we're more likely not to set our eyes on the other things that are wanting our worship. When we begin to search carefully for Jesus, we quit searching carefully for other things. And I'm not saying don't take care of babies and your families, but like first things first, Jesus. And so the words of the evil King Herod we're actually quite wise. Search carefully for the child, and when you find him, worship him. Worship Jesus. And we know that Herod is quite evil because in Matthew 2, 13 and on, he actually had all the boys um, from that vicinity in that time frame that were two years and under killed after the Magi left. He's an evil person. But he gave the advice to them that they actually needed to hear. Go and search carefully for the child. And in his deception and in his intent to kill the kids, because he wanted to kill the Savior, he gave them the very nugget that they needed for life. It's the very nugget we need. Search Jesus. Search for him carefully. And find him. And look into him. Discover him. Meditate. Read about him. Talk to him, pray to him, worship him, bow down again, then worship again, and then study again. Then you'll worship again. You'll worship more than anything else. The more we discover Jesus, we'll just worship. Because we go, that is amazing. Jesus is amazing. You know, and Herod said he wanted to worship, but it was deception. It was demonic, actually. He talked about wanting to come and worship Jesus. It was under a cloak of deception. He wanted to come and kill the Savior. That's what he wanted to do. And so these wise men, um, well, yeah, and I really, I was challenged again because I'm looking at this and going, I really love Jesus. And there are these songs that invoke emotion sometimes. And I go, do I like certain songs more than I like Jesus when it comes to worship? I go, I want to worship Jesus doesn't really matter about the song or anything. And I was reminded um, years ago when I was working at the, a church in Kamloops and um, some pretty wild things were going on and worship was going on. And, you know, I think for the congregation sometimes, sometimes we're just lost in worship and sometimes the worship leaders go on, 
oh my goodness, this is the hardest thing ever. <laughs> it's a hard time leading worship sometimes. And I was, remember talking to this worship leader, a friend of mine. She goes, man, I always knew, Mike. It didn't really matter. If I thought it was good, I thought it was bad. The song was on. The song was off. You would just worship Jesus because you love Jesus. It wasn't about the song. And I was like, really? I didn't realize it. And I, I, was, I was like, yeah, how do we just... It's not about the song. God, we want to worship you. 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 And Herod tried to keep face with his religious priests and friends and the Magi by saying he wanted to worship them. But actions always speak louder than words. And instead of going with them, he said, go and search for them and then come back and tell me. And if you really want to worship Jesus, I ain't sending somebody to go find him. I'm going to hunt for him. I'm going to look. You know, I go, Herod, you missed out on an opportunity to actually have your life changed by the Savior of humanity, and instead you sent somebody to go. You know, and I love, I love church. I think it is essential. I think what we're actually doing here is essential to life and growth and small groups. But eventually, this journey of Jesus, I go, I have to own it. And I remember as a teenager going, I love listening to other people and, and all these things. But if it doesn't become mine, it, how, like I need it to be mine. And it became mine. And we need to search carefully for the child. And verse 9, it says, after this interview, um, the wise men went away, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem, and they went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. And this is one amazing star. It moves, it stops, turns off, turns on, they see it, it leads, it stops, it moves. This is an amazing star. Like they followed it for two years. We saw his star. And I think the crazy thing is that nobody else from the, from the kingdom there actually went with them. I think it's nuts. Sorry, my voice is just killing. Where's my cough drops? Like, I think that is the biggest loss of anything. That these magi show up for two years, they're following a star, and they're going, we are going to go, this is where it is. The priests and the leaders in the house go, this is where the Savior is going to be born. And nobody goes with them. What happened? How did they miss that one? Like, that's a big miss. Some are little misses. That was a big miss. You missed the birth, the, the, the Savior of the world. Oh, yeah, I'm not chewing on it now. I'd rather Ricola. Nice. I'll take some water, though. Like, really, they missed out on, like, the event of the month, the event of the year, the event of humanity. They missed out on it. They missed it. Yeah, and I'd go, I want to search carefully for the child. I think we all do. It's in, with, it's in us to do it. In verse 10, um, it says, When they saw the star, thank you. It says, When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. And, and it's interesting, it doesn't say when they saw Jesus, they were filled with joy. When they saw the star again, I go, there's something about, like, I was just looking at it. I go, man, like, they're following this star, and then they're in these meetings, and they're going, where do we go? And there's the star, and they go, we're still on it. Like, there's something so profound about being led by the Spirit. And I, I'm not going to say the star was the Spirit, but now, today, on this side of it, there's something so profound when the Spirit speaks to us, and we go, there he is, and we get to fill, and we're filled with, and joy in the, in the dictionary talks about a, feeling of pleasure and happiness. I don't even know. I think when the Spirit comes and fills your life and you're following Jesus, it is, it is what you're called to do. It is satisfaction at the fullest level. It is the greatest thing I've ever been able to experience is following and doing what Jesus says. It brings the greatest satisfaction to life. It's not always easy, but it fills us in the way that we are called to be filled. And many here have done that. You, so many, countless people have gone, Jesus said to do this, so I did this. And you go, oh my goodness, that was the most amazing thing ever. It's, it's what we're called to live like. And I love it. And I go, God, more of those. More of those things. More of those ways. 
You know, I think people are spending their lives trying to know that joy outside of Jesus, and they're coming up empty. We all know people who are trying to fill and have joy, and they're coming up empty. And we have the joy. We have the satisfaction. It's called the Savior. It's Jesus. And so the, um, in verse 11, it says, They, the Magi, entered the house, and they saw the child with his mother. And they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Imagine, this has been a two-year journey at least. Imagine that's the moment. Like we read this and go, oh, that's nice. They bow down and give this. Like imagine the star stop and you go, this is it? Oh my goodness. And they walk in like, this is the king. This is the savior of the world. That's the moment. And they walk in and they bow down um, and they give him gifts and they worship him. And, and it is profound. It is the most amazing thing. They got to be face to face with the Savior as a two year old. That would have been pretty wild. Wise men from the East bowing down to a two year old, realizing this is the Savior of humanity. They had something. I want to search carefully for the child. And so this journey that they were on was about worship. They were called to come and worship Jesus, a God they didn't even really believe in. They're Gentiles from the East came to worship because they knew something happened on earth and we are going to invest our lives in this. Because this is worthy of our time. It's worth our time. I love it. <laughs> and so when we look at their gifts quickly, um, they're, very, uh, they're very practical and very prophetic in nature. And this whole story, as we've been looking, has been quite practical and very prophetic. The birth of Jesus. And practically, they were gifts from their country. They brought what they had. It's pretty amazing that those are the gifts they actually brought and what they represent for Jesus throughout his life. It's pretty amazing how they were led to bring that. And they were prophetic in nature. Gold represents the office of the king. Jesus was king. He was a king. Frankincense was a spice used by priestly duties. Jesus was the priest. Jesus is the high priest. And myrrh was an embalming ointment used in death. Jesus was the savior. It was amazing, prophetic gifts by people who didn't know God. Okay, God, come and speak again. You know, and it's pretty amazing when you start thinking about how the cross was, there was a big cross shadow over that crib or when they met that, that little baby Savior. <laughs> and they said, we're going to bring ointment for your death at the beginning of your life because this is what you're called to do. You're the Savior. And I was challenged. I was like, what gifts, what gifts am I bringing Jesus this year? And I don't have a, a camel full of gold or frankincense or myrrh. But I think what the kids were sharing last, um, last Sunday evening, it's like, hey, what did they have to give? What did the kids say? Me. I said, hey, I'm going to give me. <laughs> it's the best gift. I'm going to give you me, all of me. The parts that aren't really nice, the parts that are a little bit messy, that I would rather try to fix myself, I'm going to actually give those all to you because you're the Savior. I'm going to give you me. And I think, though, that is the first step to go, hey, I'm going to give you me, and then it's like now I'm going to intentionally keep trying to unpack my life and giving it to Jesus again and again and again and again because I want you to know me and I want to know you. Again and again, I'm going to intentionally give myself to you again. Where's Lauren? Where's is Lauren out here? There he is. Why don't you come on up? Um, and in verse 12, it says, When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route. For God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Dreams and angels have been throughout this entire story. How amazing is it that these guys followed a star...
You can bring up the whole band. <laughs> Just had our brief conversation. <laughs> Quiet drummer. So, um, I just love that after you encounter Jesus, you don't go back the same way. These magi encountered Jesus and they went back a different way. When we encounter Jesus, we never go back the same way. Our lives are ruined in the best way possible. What the world calls ordinary, we're ruined for it. We can't do it. When we encounter Jesus, we never go back the same way. And the desire and the longing of my life is when I encounter Jesus, that the patterns that are not of Jesus are broken and changed so that I don't go back to the same way. And so these guys were told in a dream, go back a different route. And I think now when Jesus speaks to us and we go, that feels so great and it fills me up. I go, I long for the things that are trying to destroy those feelings and the truth in my life. I want them to be removed because I don't want to go back the same way. I don't want to be the same. I think when you meet Jesus, you're changed. Salvation's the beginning. Sanctification is the growth and that we would change and become more like him and grow into a greater likeness of Jesus. We're little Christ on the earth. And so Jesus, we want to meet you and we don't want to be the same again. We want to grow to be more like you. You are changed forever. Your life is forever altered when you run into Jesus. It's never the same. It's not always easy, but it is so right and it is the truth the truth. And so this season um, where we, you know, there's all this stuff going on. I just go, how do we search carefully for the child, for Jesus, for the Savior? And I want to worship Jesus. You know, when I think of this story again and again, you took these guys on this two-year-plus journey who didn't even know God to present something to the Savior of the world. And I go, oh my goodness. And, and it just says they walked in, presented their gifts, and then they left. I don't think it happened that way. I think they, there, was, there must have been a conversation after they worshiped for a long time. And they go, man, we made it. We made it. You know, and I just, I just go, how do we just hang out with Jesus more and more and worship him in this season? A lot of us have time off and go, God, help us to search carefully for the child. Devote more of our time to Jesus. You know, and I love thinking about, you know, all these guys in Scripture who encounter Jesus and walk with them. They would have had the best stories with their grandkids later on in life. Like the best. Let me tell you about the time I went on a two-year camel ride following a star. That's not real, granddad. No, let me tell you about it. And then there were the bandits and this. And like, really. And so I start thinking about this. I go, man, like, we who pursue Jesus are going to have the best things to share with a world that actually needs to hear it. They search carefully, and they ended up with the best stories. And I'm not doing this to come up with best stories. I want this because I want to meet the Savior. But the world is craving for, for stories. We see it everywhere in media. We see it in movies. We see it everywhere. They're always trying to come up with the next best thing. And there's nothing that compares with Jesus. And the people who know Jesus have something to share in this season more than, than most. Hey, let me tell you a story about a Savior. Let me tell you how I searched carefully for the child and my life was changed forever again and again. You know, and I've had the, the privilege to do this for, I don't know, 20 years now. I barely know Jesus. You know, and I want to know more. I think all of us. You know, I think the older, the older you get, the, the more you realize, oh, there's a lot more to Jesus than I know. And I want to know more. We all want to know more. Search carefully for him. And so this morning, I, I just was... I was challenged, I was stirred. There's just an invitation to worship Jesus. Just to worship. It doesn't really matter what's going on in life, let's just worship Jesus. And there is an invitation to bow down and kind of go, okay God, I'm going to 
put aside everything that is trying to steal worship. The things that are disturbing me on the inside because of the truth that you are speaking to me, scripture, I'm gonna bow down. And I love in Revelation, it talks about they throw their crowns down. I'm gonna throw down the crowns that I think I have or people have given to me because you're the only king. I'm gonna throw them down. I'm gonna bow down and I'm gonna worship. I'm gonna worship. I'm gonna worship Jesus. Bow down, give my heart to you again and again and again. And so this morning, um, we're just gonna, we're gonna worship and you can sit, you can stand, you can kneel, whatever you need to do, but I think the challenge here is, and the invitation is actually to worship Jesus. It doesn't really matter where we're at in life, he's worthy of worship. And if you are worshiping things that are not worthy of your worship, it's time to bow down and repent. Sorry, God. I want to line up with the truth. And so I'm going to, let's just pray and then we're going to worship together. And if, if there is something specific you would love or need prayer for, um, I'll just be over here. I'd love to pray with you. We have a lot of people there. But I think there's just something personally here where we just go, okay, God, where's my own heart? And are there things that are stealing my worship? And I want to bow down and give the best of what I have, and that is my life to you. And so, God, we thank you how you, you showed yourself in the night sky in a star, and these men who didn't know you followed you. And they brought gifts that were prophetic and they displayed your life. They said, this is what's going to happen in your life. And they bowed down and worshipped you, Lord. And we want to fall in line with the millions that have before us. Bow down and worship Jesus. And raise your name up and proclaim who you are. And we, I do, and we again just commit to surface search carefully for you. We want to know you in fullness. Lord, in the areas in our life that are um, disturbed by the truth, Lord, we're, uh, we're given in to you. I don't want to be ruled by the disturbances. I want to be ruled by the King of Kings. And so, Lord, help us in this season to discover you in new ways encounter you in new ways, Jesus.